Societies trends are always changing, and what consumers want affect food supply chain, including your farm and cattle breeding. But how will these trends impact cattle breeding in the future? And what will farming look like in 2040? To discuss these trends and technologies that will define the farming of tomorrow, we're joined by an expert cattle breeder and geneticist with 20 plus years of experience and an international multi-award winning journalist specialized in all aspects of farming and agriculture. Lars Nilsson, Chief Breeding and Production Officer at Viking Genetics, and Chris McCulloch, an international freelance journalist based out of Belfast, Northern Ireland. This is the Breedcast produced by Viking Genetics. I'm your host, Hilke Biesma. Hello and uh, welcome to both of you, Lars and Chris. Thanks for joining us. Hello, hello. Good morning. Chris, you've been in the industry for, for many years. Tell us how farming has evolved uh, in your years of reporting. Uh, yes, well, I suppose I've been a journalist now for over 21 years. And when I started journalism, I was sending copy through to the editors via a fax machine. And now I'm using all sorts of technical gizmos and things like that. And I guess farming has evolved in the same way. Um, when I when I was younger, we were milking the cows in a buyer with no automatic cluster removers, just uh, hand, hand putting them on the machines on by hand. Now we're looking at robots that can do these types of things. So the, it's moved pretty quickly. 20 years isn't such a long time, but technology, knowledge, gen genetics, breeding, everything has moved so fast in the last 20 years that a dairy farmer who was finishing 20 years ago wouldn't recognize the industry today. Lars, what, what's your take on that? What's been the most impactful for from your point of view? It's no doubt that... Uh, the last 20 years, the, the biggest change has been introduction of genomic selection in 2008, and that have de developed uh, a lot since that. Um, we have got much more detailed information on the genetics we use. Uh, we have got must, much faster genetic progress. And the acceptance of the, the Nordic style of breeding, as we say it, with the focus on the health traits uh, and the functionality, has been developed a lot uh, and it has been much easier to introduce with genomic selection. So uh, I will say that's the biggest change and the biggest impact I have seen uh, during my my work time here. So of course, um, consumers and consumer trends influence um, what we produce and the food supply um, and you know the farmer's way of farming basically. Chris, in, in your mind, what are the what are the most influential trends at the moment? Well, it's it's uh, there's big emphasis on now what consumers think and what they say and what they want, and it's influencing the the supermarkets and the processors. I guess the trends at the moment is uh, consumers want to know exactly where their food came from, when it was produced, where it was produced, how it was produced, and that's putting big pressure on on uh, processors, supermarkets, and farmers to do that, to get that knowledge to them. Sometimes I wonder if you stopped 100 consumers in the street, how many would actually care where their food came from? But it is a trend that's starting to emerge. It's starting to bite. It's starting to take effect on farms. And unfortunately, it's becoming a bit of a shackle to farmers and how they do their, their daily business. Yeah, and I guess uh, some even would argue that uh, are we even producing milk and, and beef as we do today in, a, in, in the setting that we do. I mean, uh, factory-produced milk and factory-produced meat. Um, what, do you, what do you take on that? Are we even producing the milk uh, in the future as we, will, as we are now? I, I guess as demand will, will take us in that direction. But yes, factory-produced milk and meat in, on, in some countries, mass-produced is, is taking over. But the, there's also the fact that the consumer is maybe going against that tre trend and wanting the smaller type farms where there's a more personal relationship with the farmer, with the producer, with the consumer. Again, it's all down to majority of consumer wants, but I, I'm not sure it's going to go in the, in the factory uh, direction in the future. I think it'd be more of a personal approach coming up. So, Chris, in your mind, what, what, cha what challenges are the farmers facing then in terms of these challenges? I think the biggest one is cost. You know, how much is it going to cost to, to line their farms up to tell consumers and have that relationship with the consumers and also produce the food in the direction that the 
supermarket is telling them to. Um, again, time is a factor, but I think the biggest one is cost, patience as well. And if they can endure all these uh, challenges, to whether they can actually stay in business or not. Lash, what's your take on that? I, I see the same. I, I think that one of the biggest challenges, that's the overwhelming amount of documentation uh, they need to have. Uh, and for some farms, that's just too much. And, and it's, it's not the way they want to farm. Uh, so you can say all this documentation, that's an opportunity for us with the product we have, but at the same time, a, a risk uh, because it's, it's too, it can be too much. But also, you know, we, we do see a huge political push uh, towards a green transition and towards, um, you know, uh, being more efficient uh, towards uh, climate. Um, and we did discuss that in a, in a previous episode here on the Breedcast. Um, Chris, what are you experiencing uh, that farmers are doing towards this green transition? Yeah, I, you know, you've got to take it into context. I think if you're going down the green political line, that some of the in the, some of the countries, the green parties are in the, hugely in the minority at the moment, but yet they're driving uh, regulations, they're dri driving legislation into which direction we want to go. And I think that's getting the farmers' backs up. They're being pushed in a direction that they see you know, they've been farming for 20, 30 years and suddenly you're trying to tell them how to do things differently and it's just not sitting well with them. Um, they are, they know that they have to become greener. They know that they have to produce less emissions, but there's a, you know, there's a time factor here, a cost factor and a practical factor. Lars, what do you think? I, I, I see the same here. Um, and in principle, I, I, I think a huge, uh, I see a huge willingness from the farmer actually to adapt to, to the consumer. I do see uh, a change uh, from, from the farmers, from being farmers actually, to being food producer and try to understand the need and, and, and wish from the consumers. Um, so uh, it's just to find the tools to, for the farmers also to, to de deliver uh, what the consumers uh, demand. Yeah, and I think w one of these tools might be uh, the traceability that the consumers that, the, you know, they, they want to know where the, the, the food is coming from. Like you mentioned, Chris, maybe it's it's more of a personal relation. What yeah. traceability, stuff like that. What, mm -hmm. what do you think about that, Lars? I think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, and and uh, one of our uh, responsibilities uh, from our side, that is to to bring in the 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 right tools, so uh, so so you are you are able to do it. You are able to follow it. So it's it's easy and simple. Uh, you can say electronical ear tags, uh, following the animal from from birth to to the slaughterhouse. Um, it can be automatization in general and and sensor technology that can document about the the animal both the size and and whatever it, so it's not handheld solution where you need to write and you we use the papers but anyway actually the things are done automatically from the, in the system and by different technologies being able by the when when the meat or the milk is in 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 the desk in the supermarket it's uh, all the information is there by smart solutions. Chris, what, what's your thought on uh, on the traceability part? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the supermarkets have to identify the product as being from real farms, not just fake made up names that they use for their marketing. It has to be real farms that the people can identify and say, oh, look, I know where that guy is. But in the supermarkets, I guess consumers can come along with their uh, mobile phone and use a QR code or something that can mm. identify the product and the path right through to where the farm was. Um, more so, I'm seeing practical things like open days on farms where uh, usually here in, I think it's June, where farmer, uh, the consumers can go to the farm, talk to the farmer direct, what, he, what he's produced and how he produced. They can see themselves, the welfare um, that the animals are in. And I think a personal relationship sometimes matters more than anything you can do in a supermarket with electronic devices. But again, it comes down to what I said earlier. If you took a hundred consumers and you asked them, do you really care where your food come? Are you passionate about that? How many would say, yeah. What's your, th what, what do you think? I'm not so sure. I think, I think it would be in the, probably in the minority of the minute. I think the first thing they see in the packaging is the price. 
not where the, the product came from. So technological advancements in cattle breeding can help the farmers to get healthier, um, more efficient animals that result in higher quality food. One way of doing that is using the power of big data. Because of the extent of the database that we have in the Nordics, we have a large amount of control and quality through the data uh, that we use. Lars, all this data, how does it benefit uh, the consumers? By the end of the day, uh, all the data we collect into our national cattle databases benefit the, the consumers a lot because uh, we are, based on all that information, uh, able to detect the right breeding animals, breeding for the traits that the consumers ask for. So more healthy animals and also more efficient animals. Uh, so you can say by the end of the day, all this data is the background for being able to reduce the use of antibiotics, uh, giving, giving, uh, giving more uh, food safety. Uh, and at the same time, some of the new technologies we are working at, like uh, feed efficiency, all this knowledge can reduce the carbon footprint uh, at the same time. So the important thing for us here is that we have all this data available. Uh, and also all this data available at the same place. So we buy new technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence are able to actually calculate the, the different connections because one thing is if we, we breed for some kind of one advantage like more efficient cows, but if those more efficient cows are more sick uh, or need more antibiotic treatments, it's a disadvantage. So that's why we, we need the holistic uh, approach to this. And that's why all this data uh, and, and all the data at the same time is very important for us in our uh, processes here. Yeah. So what you mentioned is some of the, the, the technologies on, on, on the back of uh, all this data. Chris, um, what, what technology do you see out there uh, when you you know, do your writing and, and reporting. Uh, what technologies do you see that helps farmers in this transition? Well, I, I agree with Lars uh, completely. The, the big advantage is having all the data available to know which direction to go. The buzzwords in uh, media, agricultural media at the moment is sustainability. So anything that helps s sustainability is a hard word to say, um, is, a, is a good, and you, for that, you know, you're talking about small, maybe smaller cows, eating less, producing more milk from the same animal, um, looking at the carbon footprint, locking carbon away, releasing carbon, all these different types of things need technology to, uh, first of all, find them, report them and process them. So it is hugely important. Lars, from a breeding perspective, what, what, are, the, what are the technologies that, uh, that are being used or that can help uh, other than the things that you mentioned? You can say... Um for us, when we, we do the breeding, it's very important that we, we connect, you can say, phenotypes with genotypes. So we know what is actually affecting the, the, the phenotype. So, so all these feed efficiency and, and, uh, and health traits, which genes are, are the ones driving this? So uh, full-scale uh, genomic testing uh, of our animals is uh, an important tool for us. Uh, to 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 make the connection between the the genes and uh, and the phenotypes uh, for making the right progresses, and that's uh, an ambition we do have uh, in Viking Genetics uh, on home market animals really to to have full scale genomic selection on on all animals. So and but one of the things that Chris is mentioning as well is is a smaller type of cow. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on that? We have. Uh, within Viking Genetics, uh, you know, both the opportunity of uh, some crossbreeding, but the jersey as well. What what do you think about that? I will say, uh, as a baseline, uh, we have an understanding that the smaller cows are more efficient uh, than 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 the bigger cows. Uh, you can say due to the to the energy uh, used for for uh, maintenance, um, but. With the CFIT camera solution we have, 
uh, we have a much better information uh, about uh, the single animal and and the efficiency uh, on on him or her. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, for that reason, I can give a much better answer. But uh, as a baseline, yes, I'm sure that the the medium size smaller animals are more efficient, and that that is the style and and the animals we are we are breeding for. You mentioned crossbreeding as a solution to make more resilient animals. Uh, that's also something we bring into the pure breed. But by doing the crossbreeding, it may have an even bigger impact and and a bigger influence. And that's a that's a tool we of course will use. Chris, which of these technologies in the future do you think will have the the largest impact? That's a good question. Um, again, it depends on the direction that farmers need to produce food. If in terms of pure technology, I think genomic testing is one of the biggest attributes a farmer can have. And I'm I'm noticing more now when I go to dairy farms to write a story about them. That's one of the things that uh, some more farmers are starting to do and starting to get excited about and talk about. And, you know, five, ten years ago, would that have been a big thing? I, I don't think so. But in the future, it's going to be, you know, it's not exactly cloning cows, but it is it is breeding to your advantage um, in the future of, a, of exactly the animal you need to produce the product that you need um, in that form that's going to sell to consumers and what they want. Yeah, and now you mentioned the consumer. What 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 is the consumer aspect of this? Some would say it's maybe too much. They have too much say in, in how farmers produce food. But I guess if, if you know you need to produce to the, the demand that they're talking about, um, it is an important relationship from farmer to to consumer via the process or via the supermarket. But at the end of the day, it has to be a fair process. It has to be one that is economically viable for the food chain. But uh, sometimes you get the impression that these consumer groups are being driven by false information or by false claims from other bigger companies with multi-billion budgets to spend on marketing. So you just got to be careful, you know, which road did you go to in order to get the right track to produce food for that majority consumer. We have been talking about uh, gene technology, especially genomic selection, and it has a huge role to play in the cows that we will breed for the future. Chris, in what ways can genetics help farmers adapt to these changes? Well, exactly what we've been talking about earlier. I mean, I'm not a I'm not an expert, but um, the farmers know that they need to produce a cow that's adaptable to their farm, that can eat the grass that they produce, can stay healthy, can stay alert can stay productive by the means that they have to feed it to finance it and to uh, make a profit so that you know that's one of the biggest things Lars, what's your take on that i will say um, whenever we have a trait where there's genetic variation and you're able to measure we are also able to change by natural way and uh, we do that, and we are, I think we are getting better and better listening to the consumers. But in Viking genetics perspective, you can say we, we are in a little bit the dilemma that we have been discussing earlier also. What are the, what are the uh, consumers willing to pay? Because we, we are in general uh, breeding for better and better quality, uh, milk quality, uh, with... Uh, trying to seek new components like A2, A2 and, and so on. But, but also with the meat, uh, beef on dairy is a huge part that we use more and more beef on dairy. And that's a tool we can use. But also that it's not only volume, but also quality. And we have different opportunities to, to improve that. Uh, some can be done by natural way. But the next step is when and how are we allowed to use newer technologies like CRISPR. Chris, tell us what CRISPR is. CRISPR, that's a, that's a tool where you can say instead of uh, the natural way of breeding where you just select what you have, CRISPR is a tool where you start to, to, uh, to play with the genes, uh, where you neutralize some single genes and, and take them out of the equation. Uh, and, and then, or in principle, you also 
move genes from animal to animal, and and that way you can introduce baldness, for example, in uh, in horned animals uh, by using this technology. But Chris, when you when you listen to that, what because you you know you mentioned that it's a, a local relationship to the the places that the food has been produced. Uh, using technology like that is very futuristic. What, what's your take on that? How does that balance? Well, again, it's, it comes down to the need if the farmer needs it, if the industry needs it. But it, when you use uh, you know terms like CRISPR, it can be quite scary for farmers or consumers to think, "Oh my goodness, you're you're uh, tinkering with the genes. This is uh, geno- genetically modifying. This is not the direction we want to go." But it it could be the direction if you want to go. The way the climate is changing. The way uh, productive systems are changing, as Lars said, maybe we do need to eliminate some uh, trait from it by by or eliminate the gene to uh, influence the trait. Who knows? But it, it's it is being more and more talked about now. In fact, that it's some stories last week about CRISPR. I knew nothing about it until then, and now I know a little bit more. And, and nice. just just to say, we 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 are in the food uh, supply chain. Uh, Some food is plant-based, some is from animals. We are in the animal sector. But parallel to the plant, uh, from a, a Danish ethical council, it was mentioned that it's unethical not to use gene technology in the, in the uh, uh, plant production. So it's using... Not, not, not to use, yeah. It's not eth- ethical, just to understand that, it's not ethical to not use it. Yes, because uh, for some traits... Uh, Or some single uh, traits, yeah. It might take 10 generations to come to a certain goal. Here, you can do it like this, and in a you can say a society uh, where we miss food, uh, then a quick fix might be a better solution than waiting 10, 15, 20 years doing it by the natural way. Yeah, and I guess that's a, that's an important mm. aspect because uh, the part of the world where we're from, mm. um, you know, that there less is more or From from less to better, or but but there are parts in the world that actually uh, don't have the food that we have, so yeah. so that that's uh, another aspect of it. it for sure, and uh, I know it's uh, you can say in general when you ask uh, consumers whether they will uh, use uh, food coming from from uh, genetic manipulated uh, uh, origin, then most people will say no. But when you start to talk about what is what is it actually, they might have another answer, uh, and I think it's a huge part for EU to discuss this. And who knows? Like you say, uh, lack of food can quite often make new solutions. Yeah, Chris, what what is your take on that? The the the, the balancing of um, these new technologies and and societal and political pressure. Well, you know, food is the biggest driver in, in uh, humanity today, because if we don't, or in populations around the world, if we don't have food, then we're in trouble. And it is it is going to come to it. I mean, those countries at that at their moment, they're a bit skeptical about this type of technology. I guarantee in 10 years time, they probably will be using it because the need for the food is there. The need for the traits, the need for everything that we we have discussed is there. And although they might put up resistance now, you can see a change in the political situation around the world that they are starting to follow maybe the minority of, of voters or consumers in this direction but they know that politically that this is going to come and if they want to safeguard their political job this is the direction they need to go if you were to give a uh, summary here at the end what are the most important things that farmers should remember in discussing cattle breeding and cattle farming uh, to be ready for 2040 Chris, let's start with you. What what are the two most important things in your mind? I think um, if it comes down to breeding, well, sustainability, as, as I said, is the biggest buzzword uh, going on at the moment. But when it comes down to breeding, is, is it possible? You know, can they use this, use these genetics to breed exactly what they want in terms of what the consumer wants and in a timely fashion and in an economically viable fashion? Um, it's got to be... There's so many regulations sweeping across Europe now, sweeping across the world, that farmers need to adhere to in order to produce this food. So that they've got their eyes on so many different balls in order to stay in business. The, the unfortunate thing is the regulations that European farmers, Western farmers might agree with 
or have to comply with. It's not going to be the same in Eastern countries, poorer countries, less developed countries, who are going to be very far behind in terms of uh, that stage that they're at to produce food for the consumer. But it's something that's going to take take off in countries and be very slow in other countries. But it's going to be needed if we're going to feed a population of 9 billion by 2050. Lars, what the most two important things from your side? I think... Um... It's, it will be extremely important for, for the farmers to be agile and be ready to, to transform their, their production to the needs from the consumers. Uh, that's extremely important. And then general, uh, a smart way of doing documentation. I think documentation is a, will continue to be a huge part. Uh, we need to find the right way so, so they will not die in all this. And um, we need to be prepared to give them all the right tools, so all these uh, changes, all this need for new tools can be implemented as fast as, as the consumers need it. It can be, be the CRISPR, it can be other tools, so we really need to be, be fast executors uh, when it's needed. Thanks everyone for joining the broadcast today. We've had a look at the future and how today's trends are shaping what cattle farming might look like in 2040. To learn more about innovative breeding, please visit our website, vikinggenetics.com. Thank you, Lars Nilsson and Chris McCulloch for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Thanks for everybody out there listening. If you have an idea for a topic in the world of cattle breeding that we should focus on, then please visit Viking Genetics Facebook page or thebreedcast.com. My name is Hilke Wiersma. Please join me for the next Breedcast episode where we'll focus on the Nordic Total Merit Index, which can help you breed for health, benefit profits, and improve your herd. <laughs>